In the Gospels, we hear about a couple of men who came to the disciples and said, Sir, we would see Jesus. As we begin our study in the book of Hebrews on Through the Bible, we say the same thing. We want to see Jesus. Are you with me? I'm Steve Schwetz, and I know this was Dr. J. Vernon McGee's heart, that everyone who comes to this study would look through the pages and see Jesus. This little verse in John 12, Sir, we would see Jesus, was so important to Dr. McGee that he had it engraved on the back of his pulpit where he could see it when he preached. And this is still our prayer at Through the Bible today. For ourselves and for you, we want to see Jesus. So as you open your Bible, Greg and I have got a quick update on some things happening at Through the Bible that we pray are helping others to see Jesus too. Yeah, Steve, we have kind of an exciting announcement today, and that is uh, for years we've been talking about these wonderful tools called Bible Companions, where we have carefully uh, edited Dr. McGee for print, and yeah. we've started by releasing them digitally, and I have a bunch of them on my iPad, and and uh, I know you've been using them in your church yep. for your small groups. Yep. There are several small groups that have been using it, and if you've heard us talk about home groups and you're excited and it's like, well, what's this media kit and what's this other stuff? Well, you can't have that because it's specific to the particular country that we're in, but if you have a desire to start a small group in your home, if you want to go through a discipleship program with a friend— hey, these Bible companions are a great resource for you to use. Yes, and we have heard from you. We listen. When you call in and and pass along comments and questions, our team makes sure that Steve and I hear about these things. And so our team now is going to generate print versions of the Bible Companions. And, you know, most people, when they're in a study group, they want to have a book in their hands. And so we are very excited that we are now able to offer all of the New Testament books, all 27 books of the New Testament, Mm -hmm. in a printed Bible Companion format. And these are beautiful books, Steve. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if you don't want to go through the, you know, like what we do, we we, we download the PDF and send it to the church uh, administrator, Carolyn, who faithfully makes... Uh, color photocopies, and you don't want to go through that yeah. process. We got a print version for you that is not free. You would have to pay for it, uh, but it is certainly a better size and it has a, m- a more substantive feel to it. Yes. And uh, one of the things we're also going to do is we're going to have a special pricing for 10 packs because, yeah. because people often have, say, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 in a group, and you can buy it for a reduced per unit price uh, in order to make it very cost effective for you to start a group. Right. So, and we're not trying to make any money on this deal. No. We're basically covering printing and doing it at cost because God has been so faithful to this ministry with people that support it, but we don't want the Bible companion part to come out of the regular giving that gets the whole word out to the whole world. Exactly. And that's an important point. We're not. This is just a resource. We're, we're essentially giving it to you at whatever our cost is, and we just want it to be a ministry tool. Now, one of the things that I think is really exciting, Steve, is we've already got gotten responses from people using these Bible companions. Yeah, let me read this first one. This is from Kent in Corona. Six months ago, I had never heard of Through the Bible or J. Vernon McGee. Six months ago, I also didn't know the first thing about how to read a book of the Bible, its historical context, its structure, and the beauty of seeing Jesus hiding in plain sight for anyone to see. If only they would just look. My small group leader introduced the Book of Revelation Bible Companion study to us and encouraged us to, at the least, read a lesson each week and the Bible passage every day. Well, that little assignment changed everything for me. Eventually, I also listened to Dr. McGee's fuller explanation on the radio program. I listened to the podcast. I feel like this study has opened a whole new world for me. Now, I'm with you on the Bible bus, and I understand that I'm joining with a company of people who have been traveling this road for decades. Well, make room for me, and maybe some more I'll bring along with me. This stuff is too good not to share. <laughs> Love that. Now, here's from Jerry from Nantucket Island, Massachusetts, who asked, Do you have more of these Bible companions? I just finished all four gospel studies online and really want to study more. All right. I found you on YouVersion, but those plans were great, but just a teaser, really short. In fact, Steve, you voiced those plans. Uh, Now, Jerry goes on. These lessons are much better with questions to ask yourself, too. I want to study the whole Bible this way. When I shared this study with my older brother, he said that he remembered when our parents 
studied with through the Bible every night at the kitchen table. Hmm. They kept a list of the Bible books and checked them off as they studied them. He remembered he was told he could ask any question about the Bible he wanted, but he had to wait until he heard the closing music. <laughs> he was thrilled to hear about these companions. Do you have them in print? Well, Jerry, yes, we do. And she finally continues, tell me more and I'll pass the word. Wow. Beautiful. Thank you, Jerry, so much for being uh, a faithful listener and now a faithful consumer of the Bible Companions. May God bless you that way. Let me pray for us as we begin. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would use this new ministry tool that we have to expose more people to your Word, that they might see Jesus plainly on every page of Scripture, as Dr. McGee talks about. Pray that you would bless the ministry and the program as it goes out now. In Jesus' name, amen. We're off to Hebrews 1 on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now we've come, friends, in the epistle to the Hebrews, to chapter 1, verse 2. We're not getting along very fast, and it's not our intention to do that, because we believe that this is an epistle that in a very peculiar way reveals Jesus Christ. And we want to see him as the Spirit of God will open to each one of us, a measure of insight into the glory of his person, because that's important. Andrew Murray put it like this, the knowledge of Christ Jesus that we need for conversion does not suffice for growth, for progress, for sanctification, for maturity. And then he added this, our one need is to know Jesus better. And this epistle will help us to do just that. Now, we saw last time here in this first verse that what we have here is Christ is superior to the prophets because all of them, the best that could be said was they gave merely a partial revelation. God never let any one of the Old Testament writers give a complete revelation. You have to put it all together to even get the Old Testament. But now God has spoken finally, completely, and adequately, and assuredly in the Son. And verse 2 begins, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son." And as we said last time, the literal is, to us, God spoke in the Son. Now, we see here, he's saying, he hath in these last days spoken unto us. And the us, I think, is very important. He's spoken to the same ones that he spoke to the fathers, by the prophets, in the Old Testament. Therefore, These were Hebrew believers. Now, if God has given his final word in the Lord Jesus Christ, then this is the final word for you and me today. And you remember the Father out of heaven said, This is my beloved Son, hear ye him. And he is the one that is before us. Now he says he hath spoken unto us by the Son. Therefore, Christ is superior to any of the Old Testament writers because the revelation is filled up in him. He fulfills all of the Old Testament, and he himself gives God's final word to man. Or as we said last time, if God spoke out of heaven today, he'd just have to say something that Jesus has already said because of the fact the final word came through the Son of God when he was here 1,900 years ago. As he himself said, the Spirit of God will take the things of mine and show them unto you. And the Spirit of God, speaking through John and James and Dr. Luke and Paul, has given us the full revelation from God. And now he shows the superiority of the Son in seven matchless statements that we have here. And these statements, I'm sure that none of us feel like that we comprehend any one of them completely. Now, I want us to notice it. I'm reading verse 2. 
hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now, two of the statements are here. Number one is, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Now, that reveals the program for the future. The Lord Jesus Christ is the heir of all things. But very frankly, there's something here that we need to look at rather carefully. All things were made by him, John says, and without him was not anything made that was made. So it belongs to him already. Creation is his, for he created it, we are told. And so how can he be the heir of all things? May I say to you, he came down to this earth and took upon himself our humanity. And the first man in the human race was given dominion over this creation. And we don't emphasize that enough because in Genesis, tremendous statements are made with just a few words. We had one of the Christians in Israel when we were over there some time ago speak to us. And when he came to the end of his message, he wanted to give an illustration. He says, I want to say this to you in little words. And what he meant was few words. He intended to make it brief. Well, that's the way Moses wrote the first 11 chapters of Genesis with little words. And when I say little words, he's stating it briefly. And when God says he gave to man dominion, he didn't make him sort of a first-class gardener to set out rose bushes and prune the plum trees. That's not what Adam did. Adam had dominion, and dominion has to do with rulership. All creation was under him. I think that when he wanted to reign, he called in the rain. I think that when he wanted the heat turned on, why, he turned it on. I think he controlled this earth. Now, he lost that. And when the Lord Jesus came to this earth, he became a man. And you'll notice that one of the reasons he performed certain miracles, he performed them in every realm, the natural realm, the physical realm, he had control of the human body, had control of nature. He could still the storm, and he could feed the 5,000. He recovered that. Now the Lord Jesus is going to be heir of all things. He recovered what Adam lost. And we're told in Scripture that we are heirs of God also, and we're joint heirs with Christ. Now that's an interesting word, joint heirs. And that doesn't mean equal heirs. Let me illustrate that. Some folk have been very much interested in our radio and have given it wonderful support, and they'll mention us in the will. And sometimes they put us in as a joint heir and sometimes equal. Sometimes they say, well, I want so much to go to this mission cause and so much to the through the Bible. Well, that's equal, that is, each one of us, and we could squander it, I guess, if we wanted to, but you can be sure of one thing, we don't do that here. But the thing is, it would be ours. But sometimes you're a joint heir, and that means somebody else has control of all of it, and they just allocate out so much to each one at the proper time, and they manage the estate. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ... He's the heir, and we're just joint heirs, and that means that he still controls it, but he may let me have a little patch somewhere. He may give me charge of some little something, but that's the way that we're joint heirs today with Christ so that we have an inheritance, friends, that's incorruptible, it's undefiled and unfading, and it's reserved in heaven for us. Why? Because of the many wonderful things he did for us, he recovered what Adam lost, and even more than that. And we today are joint heir with him, so that he's the one that's going to inherit everything. And as far as I know, no prophet was ever promised that in the Old Testament. 
Now we are told of second thing here, by whom also he made the worlds. Now a great many people interpret this as to creation, that this refers to Genesis 1.1. Well, actually it does not refer to that at all. The word here for worlds is ion. It means ages, by whom he created the ages. Now, frankly, that's a little bit more than just creator. That lends purpose in everything. As the air, that gives the program for the future. And now, in the fact that he made the ages, that's purpose in everything. Now, he not only created everything, he did it for a purpose. And so, the Bible makes sense, friends. God created man, put him in a garden, and put down one condition. He was not to eat of a certain tree. Well, there was nothing wrong with that tree. I think the fruit on it was good. But that was God's test of that man. And after all, it was not the fruit on the tree. It was the pear on the ground. That's where the problem was. And so man absolutely and completely failed at that time. God has a program, you see, and he has a purpose in everything. And so there comes on another period in which God tests man. And then he gave man the law. And today you and I live under grace. That's the way we got in. We'd never be able to get in the law. It wasn't given to us to begin with. And the second thing is, you and I can't keep it. We can't measure up the uh, righteous standard that God has set. And God just can't save us by works at all. And I think that ought to be quite obvious to every person that God just can't save us by works. And the reason for that, I think, is very satisfactory. He can't save us by perfect works because you and I can't offer that. We can't measure up to it. And he can't save us by imperfect works because his standard is higher than that. And therefore, God had to have another way. And today, it's by grace you're saved. Now, the Lord Jesus not only is the creator, but there is purpose to this universe. This universe that you and I live in today, it's not running at breakneck speed through space and time. Where in the world could an idiotic notion like that originate, that you and I live in in a universe that's running wild today and that it's like a car that's lost the driver. The interesting thing is when a car loses the driver, there's a wreck. And this universe, according even to the scientists, has been running millions of years. And it's been doing pretty well, by the way. The sun comes up at a certain time every morning. It's certainly very precise. The moon out there, they can send one of the men that works on the module here that every one of them that's been to the moon, he says all you got to do is aim it and the moon will be there when the module gets there because you can always depend on it. It's not running. Why? Suppose the moon, when it would see this module come and say, I'm going to fool those boys and he heads back another direction. My friend, this is not a mad universe that you and I live in. It has purpose in it. And the Lord Jesus is the one that gives it purpose. Now, will you notice, as we move on down, we have another statement made here. Three, and that is in verse three, too, who being the brightness of his glory. Now, that is a very wonderful statement there, the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Now, brightness here means the outshining. It means actually the effulgence here. And I think that the material sun out yonder in space gives us a good illustration of this. We could never know the glory of this material sun. To begin with, you can't look at it directly. It would blind you if you did. But from the rays of the sun, we get light, we get heat, and actually, I think, healing from it. And that's the way we know about the sun. Now, we'd never know anything about God apart from the revelation that God's given in his son, you see. He is the brightness. We never see God. I've never seen him. I'm sure you haven't. But I know about him now through Jesus Christ. 
just as the rays of the sun with their warmth and light tell me about the physical sun, the Lord Jesus reveals God to us today. Now, when he uses this other expression here, the express image of his person. Now, that word, express image, actually means steel engraving. The word is character, and we get our word character from that. So that we say today that the Lord Jesus Christ is the revelation of God because he is God. And that is the important thing. He's not just the printed material. He is the steel engraving of God because he is the exact copy. He is the image of God. Paul says in Colossians 2.9, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. How wonderful he is. And then we're told a fourth thing here. Will you notice what is said here concerning him? And upholding all things by the word of his power. Now, I like to put it like this. That little baby lying helpless on the bosom of Mary, yonder in Bethlehem, could have spoken this universe out of existence. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Now, he not only created all things by his word, but he holds everything together today. And have you ever stopped to think about the power that's required to hold it together? Man has learned very little about it, but he has learned a little. Man took the atom, for instance, a little bitty fella, and he untied it. And when he untied that little atom and split the atom, as they say, may I say to you, he sure did release a lot of power. Well, who put all that power in there? And who holds all the little atoms together? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, he furnishes the program, the purpose. He is the person of God, and he's the preserver of all things. He not only created the universe by his word, but he holds everything together. And if he let go today, well, to begin with, you and I are held on this world that we live in. We don't live in it. We live on the thing. And if he didn't hold us here by Elmer's glue, they call it gravitation, but we'd go flying out in space. He holds everything together. And this universe had come unglued without his constant supervision and power. Now, he's not just an atlas holding up the earth passively, and he's not like the little Dutch boy with his finger in the dike. He today is actively engaged in maintaining all of creation. And in my book, friends, that's greater than creating it at the very beginning, is holding it together, keeping the thing functioning, keeping it running. And that is one of the tremendous things that he is doing today. Now, will you notice there's a fifth thing here, and that is a wonderful thing. When he had by himself purged our sins. Now, that's pardon for our sins. And he purged our sins. And by the way, this is the only purgatory that's mentioned in the Bible. He went through it for you and me. And there's no purgatory for anyone that trusts Christ because he purged our sins. He has paid the penalty. How wonderful it is. Now, up to this point, we only got to Bethlehem. Now we've come to Calvary. And he today offers pardon for our sins. And the purging was accomplished by what he did on Calvary for you and me. And today, we're accepted in the Beloved, and you can't add to anything that he's done for us. And then we'll see he's made provision for the present. We'll save that till next time, because after all, that's what this epistle's all about. He's alive today, up yonder, at God's right hand, and at this very moment, he knows it's time for me to get off the air and I'm going to get off the air. Until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved.
Next time, we'll complete Dr. McGee's study of the seven remarkable statements about Jesus found in Hebrews. So why don't you hop aboard the Bible bus and join me? Until then, to be in touch, visit ttb.org, get our app at your favorite app store, or call 1-800-65-BIBLE. Now go with God today. He's with you, and He loves you. We're grateful for our committed listening family who faithfully pray and invest in Through the Bible as we together take the whole word to the whole world.